Ever since we first saw Guts wielding the Dragon Slayer, we were wondering if he was going to use it against a literal dragon at some point. Imagine our surprise when for once our wishes aligned with Guts's as Grunbell turned out to be an apostle whose released form was that of a dragon. Yes, you heard that right. Not many apostles can claim to have been reincarnated as a literal fairy tale creature, except the Knight of Grant, of course. This video is going to be a rare case in our coverage of apostles because unlike Locus or Irvine, Grunbell Guild's origins are actually told in a spin-off light novel titled Berserk, The Flame Dragon Knight. But since it was written by the director of the divisive 2016 anime adaptation of Berserk, we're going to take it with a pinch of salt and only discuss the major events of his past life to give you an idea of why he got where he is today. So without further ado, this is Grunbeld, The Dragon Knight's Origins, Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support Support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. He's Griffith's one giant man army, Grunbeld's introduction to Berserk. Grunbeld first appeared on the pages of Berserk in chapter 184, which was released all the way back in 2001 and keep that year in mind because it will become relevant to Grunbeld's origins in a few minutes. But it was in the midst of the Siege of Shet that Grunbeld was first seen, and he made quite an impression. See, every other apostle who had shown up so far to serve Griffith at least interacted with him in some way. Even Rakshas, who just wanted to serve the Falcon of Light so that he could be the one to kill him, vocally informed his instinctive master of that fact. Grunbeld? He just bashed in a gigantic castle gate with a warhammer the size of your average NBA player and proceeded to wreck shop in order to prove his allegiances. Towering over literally every other person on the battlefield and clad head to toe in armor that was shaped to resemble the visage of a dragon, indeed, Grunbeld looked like a walking monster. In fact, some of the Kushan thought that he was a Naga, which when translated to English means a snake, but in myth refers to sentient human serpents. Snakes are an important part of Hindu mythology and show up on both sides of the good and evil divide. By calling Grunbeld a Naga, we think that the Kushan were specifically comparing him to the evil serpent Kalia, who once polluted the river Yamuna with his venom and was driven out of there by the preserver god Vishnu in his Krishna avatar. Unlike Krishna, who danced upon Kalia's head with the weight of the universe within his feet, the Kushan ended up getting trapped in the apostle's snake-like grip. No sooner had they recovered from the sheer shock of Grunbeld's apostle presence that they were blasted to smithereens by a cannon hidden inside the Dragon Knight's shield. Grunbeld's protective gear had another trick up its sleeve as well, or perhaps we should say a couple of them, because after firing that blast off, Grunbeld produces a pair of steel fangs from his shield and proceeds to slaughter everyone in sight with it. By the time he's done mopping the streets of Shet with the blood of his enemies, the sun begins setting behind the castle walls, and Grunbeld, like every other apostle gathered there, pledges himself to his eternal master, the Falcon of Light, Griffith. The next time we see Grunbeld show up is during the Battle of Loomis, where his giant knights mow down the Kushan forces besieging the city like dry grass on a field. After the battle is won, he is overseeing the encampment of the war demons and the reborn Band of the Falcon and saves Sonya and Mule Wolfflame from being eaten by Femto's apostle warriors. Grunbeld reminds his brethren that those two were guests of their master, not delicacies to be indulged in, and when the offending apostle tries to pass it off as a joke, he flatly states that he dislikes jokes. As this exchange is taking place, Mule realizes that this man is the second legendary knight of his age that he has met that day. The man before him was named Grunbeld, but was renowned in legend as the Great Flame Dragon for his fiery red hair and his ability to mow down enemies regardless of their number. If that reminds you of someone, albeit with a far darker color motif, then you're probably onto something. But Grunbeld's legend was not restricted to his appearance or his ferocious battle style. During the Hundred Year War between Midland and Tudor, Grunbeld protected his homeland, a territory in the distant north with nothing but 3,000 knights under his command. They managed to hold out for 10 years under Grunbeld's leadership, despite Tudor's markedly superior war machine. And that is why the Flame Dragon Knight's name became mythical in the current timeline. But Mule recalls hearing that Grunbeld had died on the battlefield, and the flashback image we see of him is quite different from his current existence. While still sporting his dragon motif, the 
armor worn by the Grunveld of the past was noticeably plainer. His warhammer was a standard sized one, instead of the massive warhammer we see him wielding now, one that would give even Robert Baratheon a severe complex. And his shield is the most notable difference. While it's still massive, it's a standard oval shield with a dragon sigil engraved on it, and what looks like six blades that Grunbeld keeps in it for cases of emergency. That is very different from the shield cannon that he uses at Shet and Loomis and for the rest of the story, and you'll see why that's the case in a bit as well. But as Mule gets done musing about why a dead knight is suddenly alive and fighting for the Falcon of Light, Grunbeld begins his chastising of Sonya. The happy-go-lucky seer of the Falcon was a bit too reckless for everyone's taste, and Grunbeld requests that she inform him first before she decides to visit the war demon encampment the next time. His dad instinct kicks in again when Sonya tries to promise the very apostle that tried to kill her that she'd bring him a corpse when she sees him next. So far, Grunbeld has established himself as a paragon of knightly chivalry and duty, which has been observed in apostles of his level, but is rare for apostles in general. As the thralls of demon kind, apostles are by nature reviled, and represent the very immoral base desires of mankind. Their existence is to hate and to be hated, to indulge and be indulged in. Only those with a purpose beyond their simple desire to live in the face of deep despair can attain mastery over their own apostlehood, and only four of the reborn Band of the Falcon can lay claim to that mantle. The rest of Griffith's war demons, if not disciplined by Locus, Irvine, Zod, and Grunbeld, would have eaten the humans accompanying the Falcon of Light a long time ago. But it's because the reason behind those four becoming apostles transcends anything that a base apostle could have probably made the sacrifice for, is what gives them their self-control in the first place. This is why Grunbeld was a living example of knightly discipline, and is the perfect choice for being the war demon's proverbial babysitter. But that doesn't mean he's just in the story to spout knightly ideals, despite being a demonic entity himself. The next time we see Grunbeld appear in the story is a whole two years later, when volume 26 of Berserk came out in 2003, and this is where he shows both his bravery and his brutality, because this is where Grunbeld comes face to face with guts. The Berserker Black Swordsman vs. the Apostle Flame Dragon Knight. Grunbeld's loyalty to the Falcon of Light is tested with blood. The next time we see Grunbeld appear in the story is in Chapter 223 which starts in the middle of Griffith's assault on Flora's spirit mansion tree. After being incarnated into the physical world in a body of flesh, Femto was quick to eliminate any big threats to his grand vision. Being a powerful witch who was familiar with the God Hand's movements and was friendly with the Skull Knight despite their thousand-year-old rivalry, Flora was an obvious choice for elimination in hindsight, but Guts didn't know that when he started fighting to save her from an ugly death. He was battered from his excursion into Klipoff, and in no shape to walk, let alone fight. He was sporting an astral wound which was like a slash across his very soul. Healing such wounds took great magic and a lot of time, but neither of those things was a luxury that Guts had the time to indulge in. He attacked the Apostles as soon as he saw them, not realizing that Skull Knight had been holding them off by himself for a while now. As the pair of strugglers prepare to engage the war demons in battle, Zod shows up, and Guts realizes just what was happening here. The Immortal One is amused to find both of his adversaries gathered in one place, saying that they indeed seem to be connected. But before the three of them could engage in another round of lethal combat, Grunbeld stepped out of the black smoke to make a request to the Immortal One. He had heard tell of the prowess of the Black Swordsman, the human who had managed to not only face, but slay, several apostles. As a knight, Grunbeld found the act of attacking a defenseless old woman in her home unsightly, but he told himself he had to do it to prove his loyalty to Griffith. But now, with such a worthy opponent in front of him, he felt that every step he took with his heavy heart to get here was worth taking. Grunbeld, as a warrior of the Band of the Falcon, challenges the Black Swordsman to a one-on-one -on -one duel to the death. But as he draws his Warhammer and advances on the already injured Guts, he doesn't realize his words have already rattled his opponent. Guts has no clue what happened after the incarnation ceremony and his encounter with Griffith atop the Hill of Swords. He doesn't know that Femto is styling himself as the Falcon of Light, savior of humanity, and liberator of Midland these days, and that the people themselves had named his army the Band of the Falcon again. Grunbeld takes advantage of his dissonance and swings his massive Warhammer at Guts and the latter barely manages to deflect it off of Dragonslayer. He gets his bearings again and swings it at Grunbeld in a fit of pure rage at the thought of an apostle calling himself a member of the Band of the Falcon, but that's the only strike that Guts gets in the entire fight. Grunbeld knocks him down with his shield and is impressed that Dragonslayer can withstand two blows from his Warhammer, 
but he is comfortably thrashing guts about like a gnat. As we mentioned earlier, his astral self was already injured, which meant that Grunbelt's thrashing reopened Guts' previous wounds as well, making him lose blood more rapidly. The Flame Dragon Knight puts Guts flat on his back with a final shield bash and plants his foot on the Black Swordsman's chest, claiming that this fight lacks something. He can't believe that this is the same warrior who killed multiple apostles by himself and fought with Nosferatu Zod at the same level. Of course, Grunbel doesn't know that Guts also just survived a direct encounter with a physical manifestation of the God Hand Slam, but something tells us that that would infuriate him more than impress him, so we're just going to leave that bit unsaid. The Flame Dragon Knight thinks to himself that at least Zod is facing a worthy opponent as he catches a glimpse of the Immortal One's showdown with the Skull Knight. He says that the battlefield is sacred to a warrior, that to meet death in battle is the long-cherished wish of every man who dedicates himself to his sword. But it seemed to him that the Black Swordsman wasn't worthy of an end by his own hand after all. Guts is disgusted by the fact that a monster like him was blabbing on about honor and the warrior spirit, but Grunbelt simply kicks him away and loads up his shield cannon. He fires it at Guts in an attempt to litter the ground with his remains, but his cannon fire is blocked by a mud golem manifested by Shirke at the last possible moment. The Black Swordsman vanishes from the battlefield as Grunbeld begins laying waste to the golems instead. But their magic is mostly defensive, and they are light work for the Flame Dragon Knight. Grunbeld calls the diversion cunning, but wonders out loud how long the Black Swordsman would cower behind the cover of bushes and trees when an apostle walks up to him. This war demon claims to have eaten the Black Swordsman, but something wasn't quite right. Food isn't supposed to hurt the way it was hurting him, and the answer was both awesome and terrifying. It was because Guts, powered by the Berserk armor, was slicing him open from the inside. The Black Swordsman savagely dispatches of another apostle advancing toward him with such ease that it causes Grunbelt to question if it's even the same person. Guts' fighting style is completely different from his usual skilled displays of strength. Sure, he used to always be able to swing the impossible to swing Dragon Slayer like a beast of a man, but now he was like a beast himself. He was able to use that massive slab of deadly iron like a broadsword, and he used this fact to his advantage and slammed right into Grunbeld's shield. Guts generated such momentum with his attack that he knocked Grunbeld a few inches backwards, a feat that should have been impossible given that the Flame Dragon Knight was literally twice his size. But that wasn't all. With his savage strength and speed, Guts broke Grunbeld's shield, which he alleged could withstand cannon fire, causing the Apostle to think he is fighting an inhuman himself. Grunbeld prepares to fire his shield cannon at Guts in what definitely feels like a panic move, but is shockingly brought to his knees by the Black Swordsman's own hidden arm cannon. This excites his warrior spirit, and Grunbeld takes back everything he said before. He declares the Black Swordsman the arch enemy of his kind, acknowledging his strength, and prepares to give him a taste of his own. But Grunbeld isn't quite out of surprises yet, because instead of blocking or evading the Warhammer, Berserker Guts just swings Dragon Slayer into its shaft and leaves the steel pole with a massive dent in it. He follows it up with a swing aimed squarely at Grunbeld's head. If the Apostle hadn't dodged it at the last moment, he'd have lost more than a horn off his helm and his right collarbone. This makes the Flame Dragon Knight ecstatic as he calls the Black Swordsman magnificent and the victor of this round of battle. But it's evident that he is also pissed off, because from that point onward, Grunbeld fought not as a knight of the Band of the Falcon, but as an apostle of the God Hand Femto. And this is where we finally got to see Godot's impractical creation being put to the test against what it was intended for in the first place, because Grunbeld's released form is that of a gigantic, quadrupedal, corundum scale dragon that, yes, also breathes flames. For those of you who don't know what corundum is, it's the third hardest mineral after diamonds and moissanite, and it is so durable that it can scratch almost any other mineral in existence, which is far more difficult to do than you might think. So basically, Grunbeld is like Emma Frost, but reversed. He's an impervious red dragon who breathes fire instead of reading minds. Well, at least he used to think he was impervious to damage, because Master Godot's elite black smithing skills came through for the berserker black swordsman in the nick of time. The apostle dragon whipped guts with his corundum tail so hard that he broke an arm and a leg, but the unfeeling black swordsman managed to thrust dragon slayer straight at Grunbeld's face with such force that it left a massive crack on the third hardest mineral in the world. Guts chooses to protect Shirke, Casca, and the rest of his party rather than succumb to his battle lust. Of course, his original plan was to take Grunbeld head on, but thanks to Shirke's luminous body, and Flora's ego-protecting charm, Guts was able to escape the dragon's breath at the 
last moment. The furious apostle chases after him and demands that he stand and fight, but his advance is blocked by a literal wall of flame that is Flora's daemon form. The flame dragon knight is baffled by the fact that he, a literal dragon, cannot manipulate the flames of Flora's daemon form, but he does recognize that his job there was finished. The mission was to exterminate Flora the mage, and with the dissipation of her flame form, Flora did in fact die and transition into an astral form of life. As frustrated as he might have been, Grunbeld was trying to impress Griffith, so a win was a win, regardless of his personal stalemate with the Black Swordsman. But this encounter showed us a couple of things. One, that Godot's Dragon Slayer was in fact capable of killing dragons, because we don't know any organic fire-breathing lizards that are going to have Grunbeld's Corundum Scales, and if it's Guts wielding the sword, then it's game over for the dragon already. The second was that despite being all too stoic when fighting as a human, Grunbeld wasn't entirely without fault. Guts's attacks on him with the Berserker armor surprised him a lot, and the fact that he was able to breach Grunbeld's scales drove him into a panicked-induced rage. This is why his next appearance was far more like the Grunbeld we've known so far. The next time the Flame Dragon Knight shows up in the story is in Chapter 281, three years and fifty chapters later. As the Band of the Falcon ambushes the Kushan main army that is besieging Vritanis, Grunbeld and his giant division were given the unenviable task of slaying the Kushan war elephants and causing as much chaos as humanly possible. He finds a more fitting job for his unit when Griffith confronts Ganeshka in his mobile palace. After exchanging a few words with the Apostle, Griffith realizes that his normal tactic of just being a God Hand member isn't going to work on him, so he swaps the carrot for the stick and uses his spatial manipulation powers to break every pillar holding Ganeshka's palace aloft. Grunbeld and his giants prevent the roofing from falling on their master before flipping it over on some rather unfortunate Kushan foot soldiers. With the Apostle's form exposed to the physical world, Femto once again uses his divine abilities to summon a gust of wind from the sea and bring Ganeshka to his knees. After agreeing to a final showdown at the demon city of Windham, both parties begin consolidating their strengths and eliminating their weaknesses. In the case of Griffith, that would be political opposition, but in the case of Ganeshka, it was his own existence itself, or at least his existence as it was currently. In an effort to desecrate God with his own hands, Ganeshka lowered himself into Daiba's man-made Behelet and transformed into an eldritch abomination that was labeled by his former wizard general as Shiva, the destroyer god of Hindu mythology. If you want to know more about this Cthulhu-esque transformation, go check out Ganeshka's origin video on our channel. But for now, let's continue with Grunbeld's tale. He leaps into battle for his master and unleashes fireballs on Ganeshka's pseudo-apostle spawn, fighting side by side with humanity until the moment Griffith brings the world back to a state of Fantasia. However, from this point onward, the Flame Dragon Knight's involvement in the story was minimal for a number of years. The next time we see Grunbeld properly is in 2018 a whole decade after the Millennium of the Falcon arc came to a conclusion. In Chapter 356, Grunbeld acts as one of the core reasons for the Band of the Falcon's victory against the legendary Jotnar. He personally turns a Hydra from Greek myth extra crispy and returns triumphant with the rest of his brethren to Falconia via a sky path discovered by Griffith and Sonia. Grunbeld personally arranges the stones that open up the pathway, for he is the only one big enough to do so. And the next and final time we see the Flame Dragon Knight in the story is is in the final chapter of Berserk published so far. In chapter 371, Grunbeld, Locus, Irvine, Sonia, and Mule all gather at the harbor of Falconia. At first, it isn't clear to the young noble Mule why this was the case, but that became evident when Griffith returned carrying Casca in his arms. Interestingly enough, Mule calls Grunbeld and Locus the Falcon's two wings, implying that the pair were crucial to Griffith's success as a ruler and warrior in Fantasia. And while Grunbeld might not be able to fly himself, he certainly has ensured that his master will soar higher than anyone has ever gone before. But here's the thing. Remember we said years were going to be an important part of this video? Well, here's where that gets relevant. Between the advent of Fantasia and the defeat of the Jotnar, the 2016 adaptation of Berserk hit the market. It received received, let's say, mixed reviews from the hardcore fan base at the very best, but it also gave us that soul spin-off Berserk light novel that we were talking about, which was penned by the writer of the 2016 adaptation, Makoto Fukami. While Kintaro Miura didn't have a direct hand in the actual meat of the story, he did contribute to it with around eight gorgeous and tragic illustrations of the protagonist's life before he ascended. And besides, 
If we boil it down to the basics and ignore the finer details, which usually is what turns off most readers from it, we get a pretty good idea of the origins of said protagonist's current life. So let's dive into this semi-canonical backstory of the Flame Dragon Knight Grunbeld, shall we? He was prophesized to become a red dragon one day, but his path there was riddled with pain and loss. Grunbeld's backstory is told in Berserk, the Flame Dragon Knight. So far, the only things we knew about Grunbeld's backstory was that he was active in a northern stronghold of Midland, and that he held out against Tudor for 10 years with only 3,000 men. Makoto Fukami gave that place and Grunbeld's forces names that we can relate back to everything Kentaro Miura had already told us about him, so let's start there. Grunbeld Arkbeast was born on the volcanic island Great Principality of Grant. He was the son of a minor lord who had died in battle well before Grunbeld could start to remember things, and the mother he did have taught him that death on the battlefield was the only suitable end for his own life. House Arkbeast was a noble family whose reputation had long been in decline. The fact that Grunbeld's father had died before he could teach him how to be a proper man was already embarrassing, so his mother decided to play the role of both parents. She drilled into him a sense of pride and a warrior spirit that he carries with him to this day. You know how Grunbeld told Guts that for a warrior, the only fit ending was to die on a battlefield? Well, he got it from his mom, who used to tell him that only by dying in battle could he reach God's manor in the afterlife, which seems to be a concept similar to Valhalla in Norse mythology. So already there was an immense pressure on Grunbeld to become a warrior so great that he could join the ranks that, in our world, are said to be Odin's finest. But there was another thing that made his early life a living hell, his size. Grunbeld is a giant when we first see him in Berserk. The official Berserk guidebook puts his height at 270 centimeters in his human form. For context, that is two centimeters shorter than the tallest human being in recorded history, Robert Wadlow, who at 8 feet and 11 inches was 272 centimeters tall. But the thing is, guidebooks and such tend to have bizarre stats for characters in the first place, so there is all the possibility in the world that Grunbeld was even taller than 270 centimeters. But for now, we'll stick to that. Now, you might be thinking that this isn't a big deal. We've seen an apostle gain size and strength even in their base form before. Wilde was a shriveled up old man in his true human form, so it's possible that Grunbeld was also some tiny little David whose legend was blown up to a Goliath, right? Well, not exactly. It appears that Makoto decided to give Grunbeld a growth disorder in order to justify his massive size, because Grunbeld might have been suffering from gigantism. And because such a thing wasn't known to humanity in medieval times, the only thing people saw in him was a freak. And so that was how he was treated, especially by boys his own age. One day, after an especially extreme roughing up from his peers, Grunbeld unwittingly passes out within an interstice, where he is met by a fortune teller called Benedek. It's also possible that she was a witch, because she was found in an interstice after all, but that's for later. Grunbeld's injuries were so severe that he became immobile, and that is when Benedek found him and told him what she saw in front of her eyes wasn't a freak of humanity, but a fire dragon incarnate. With her guidance, Grunbeld found a healing pool of water that revitalized him, and for the first time in his life, the child child found peace. With Benedek, Grunbeld felt his heart soothe, and the two would develop an unsaid romantic relationship later in their lives. It is stated in the story that Grunbeld thought of her as a sister, but it is implied many a time that they were more than that, and yes, we've read the story. But as all fairy tale first encounters in the Berserk first go, this one too was fated to be met with death and destruction at the end. A short while after returning from the interstice, Grunbeld's village was attacked by Tudor forces, and his mother was violated and killed. He and other Grant children were captured and taken to the Tudor fortress of Chester for conversion, where Grunbeld endured hard years of training and what can only be defined as psychological and physical torture. Their training was as vigorous as it was vicious under Officer Abe Cassis, and Grunbeld was a patriot at heart. He resisted pledging loyalty to the Tudor, but managed to survive their conversion program and even made some friends along the way, Sigur, a girl from a noble family, and Edvard, the bastard son of Archduke Kokon himself. In hindsight, this should have been his first indication that his liege was not quite right in the head, but let's focus on this trio for now. Grunbeld thought of Edvard and Sigur as his closest friends, and that was about it, but their thoughts and feeling towards him were more complicated. Edvard, who was happy to be at Grunbeld's side and fight with him in battle, felt jealous of always being overshadowed by him in every capacity. When they both attained knighthood, Grunbeld ascended 
ascended to the top and became leader of the Grunbel Brigade, while Edvard was relegated to being his second in command. While Edvard pined for Sigurd, she only had eyes for Grunbeld, who in turn only had eyes for Benedict. These two crucial sources of jealousy are what end up culminating in the moment where Grunbeld transcends his humanity, but that is further down the line. For now, all you need to know is that these three were as tight as a sailor's knot in that two-door conversion camp, and people had taken notice. When Grunbeld managed to get his revenge on the soldier that killed his mother during an official duel, it was Sigur who bore the punishment in his stead, being treated in ways we don't want to describe in our video. When Grunbeld became too rebellious for the tutors to keep trying to convert him, they decided to take out all three of the grandchildren at the same time. The trio's captors decided to put them in a fighting pit with a tiger and only wooden swords to arm themselves, but Edvard's clever intervention had also given them the very thing that would become Grunbeld's iconic weapon of choice as a flame dragon knight, a hulking warhammer. The hammer was placed near the tiger's cage to give the trio a disadvantage, naturally, but they managed to get Grunbeld to the hammer, who used it to slay the predator and save himself and his friends from a grisly death. And it was in the pool of the dying tiger's blood that he found the thing that would change his life forever, a behelet. He fashioned it into a bracelet as a keepsake and didn't think much of it then, but he would learn more of its spiritual importance in later conversations with Benedict. After being rescued by Grant forces, Grunbeld spends 14 years defending his country with his Grunbeld brigade. However, it is his fame and legendary position that he attained while fighting for his country that upset his own liege lord. Because, you see, Archduke Kakan was quite mad. He had spent his entire life being paranoid, which had turned him into a sniveling conspirator who had sold out his own nation to the Tudor Empire without the citizens or nobility's knowledge. Knowledge. and he did it all because his wife had once expressed a desire to have Grunbeld's kid. And we think she meant it as well, you guys. I mean, who wouldn't be impressed by this massive eight-foot-plus man who had to be carried on a chariot pulled by eight horses into war due to his sheer weight in full-plate armor, let alone the weapons? But as some of you might know from the main story, too much importance can turn your closest friends into your worst enemies, and that is exactly what happened to Grunbeld as well. Hakan made the decision to use Edvard's resentment against him to rip the flame dragon knight apart from the inside out. He first used his wife's attraction to Grunbeld to decree that Fulda would marry Grunbeld at some point in time. This would make him next in line to the throne of Grant and depose of Edvard as a prospect. Second, he announced an arranged marriage for Sigurd, which he knew would drive his son crazy. And drive him crazy it did. And such is the cruel grace of the ungodly god made by man that one of those things was a misunderstanding. Fulda tries to seduce Grunbeld, but as we know already, he has eyes for only one person. So he naturally rejects her offer and goes along his way. But Edvard learns of the encounter, and when he doesn't get a straight answer from either party, he naturally assumes the worst. In his despair, he takes his own mother's life, thus proving himself a worthy heir in Archduke Hakan's eyes, who then sicks his son on Grunbeld and those closest to him. Combined with an invading Tudor force of 20,000 troops, Edvard's own force of 10,000 outnumbered Grunbeld's brigade 10 to 1, so there was no hope of him coming out of this one safely from the beginning. And that is kind of the point of the origin of the story of an apostle. Nothing goes right in their lives, and then they die, and somehow things get worse when they come back. The Flame Dragon Knight is sent on a death mission by his leader, whilst Edvard attacks Benedict and her monastery, utterly defiling it with their depraved axe. He would have killed her too, had Sigurd not been there to protect Benedict thanks to Grunbeld's ominous hunch. But his insanity did manage to leave both Sigurd and Benedict with mortal wounds, and that was enough. Benedict ended up on the battlefield with Grunbeld as he was surrounded by the combined Tudor Grant extermination force. But the Flame Dragon refused to die in this battle. Handicapped with having to protect another person didn't stop Grunbeld from slaughtering his enemies. He left a tidal wave of death in his wake every time they rushed him, but their numbers just proved too great for him. He was left battered, bruised, and bleeding profusely from all over his body, and then they decided to hit him with the cannons. No, you heard us right. This is where Grunbeld's claim from earlier originated when he was shocked by Guts breaking his shield. Because in his final battle as a human being, Grunbeld Arcbeast's death began when he withstood a cannon fire using only his shield as protection. Benedek felt it as well, his life force thinning by the second. Which is why she finally gave him the prophecy she was building up to all throughout the story so far. 
She ordained that Grunbeld would sacrifice her and Sigurd in exchange for life as an apostle, but as she herself was at the edge of death, she didn't exactly mind that. Benedicte's last words to Grunbeld were to seek out the Falcon of Light and go on living, which is what broke him completely. He had been raised by his mother for this day. He was a warrior, and death on the battlefield was the only path to God's manor. But now that he was here, he realized that he didn't want that after all. Grunbeld's deep despair at hearing Benedicte's prophecy mingled with his deep desire to continue fighting until the bitter end, just as his blood smeared into the behelet around his wrist. Its face rearranged itself, and the fetish let out a chilling scream that activated the interstice and summoned the God Hand. Void, Slan, Ubik, and Conrad appear before Grunbeld's eyes and offer to grant him his deepest desire and more power besides in exchange for a price, a few precious sacrifices. When the Flame Dragon Knight asks them who he should sacrifice, they show him two visions, both the very image of despair for Grunbeld. The first is of Benedict in her death throes, the woman who saved his life and was the object of his pure affection. The second is Sigur, his fatally injured comrade, who was being approached by their now insane former friend Edvard with disgusting intentions. The God Hand busts out its patent manipulation technique and tells Grunbeld that if he gives up those who define his humanity, he would be reincarnated and find a new battlefield, promising him that Hellfire awaits him if he joins the Falcon's ranks. Grunbeld realizes that this matches exactly what Benedict foretold in her final moments, and also that he himself is about to succumb to his wounds. Determined to continue fighting, Grunbeld Arcbeast declares that he was a dragon, and chanted the words, I sacrifice, deep within his heart, thus causing the invocation of doom. The brand of sacrifice is seared into the skins of Sigur, Benedict, and Edvard, because even as messed up as he became, Grunbeld still somehow thought of him as his friend, and that's gotta go if you want to live as an apostle. He is transformed into his released dragon form, and upon manifesting, the first thing he does is give Edvard apostle-style justice for betraying him in such a way. He then turns to Sigur and Benedict and explains to them that he did what he did because he couldn't let them get violated at the hands of their enemies, no matter the cost. They understand his reasons and willingly submit themselves to his flames, thus rendering the ceremony complete. Afterward, Grunbeld takes his time roasting Officer Abe Cassis for his transgressions against the people of Grant, and then executes Archduke Kakan as well for pretty much the same reason. He also went on to destroy every other Tudor stronghold in Grant, which is about when his legend started spreading beyond Grant. And after taking care of the enemies of his human birthplace, Grunbeld decided to seek out the master of his current existence. A few years after the incidents that unfolded at Grant, Grunbeld was spotted traversing through Kushan-occupied Midland in search of the Falcon of Light, whom Benedict had mentioned in her final words. He eventually goes on to find Griffith at Shet, and you know the rest from there already. Now, admittedly, this origin story is a bit of a downer to read, because it's not nearly at the level of Kentaro Miura's creation. Grunbeld's mother and Serpico's mother might as well be interchangeable, although their stories in life differ greatly. The same can be said for Ganishka and Hokan, though their political and military decisions lie at opposite ends of one another. What unites those two is fear and paranoia, which is expressed through different motivations. But don't let that distract you from the fact that this is the only full apostle origin we've got to date. And when you look at its building blocks and hallmarks, it fits into the larger Berserk universe. But having said that, you now know why this massive, nearly nine foot tall beast was acting all true warrior spirit with guts when he saw him at Flora's mansion. It's because he's seen a lot and yet chooses to continue fighting no matter the cost. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, Thing can and should be judged upon the basis that he is now an apostle. And not only that, he's one of the two wings of the Falcon of Darkness. Marvelous Verdict. And that's a wrap for this one. To be honest, Grunbeld is perhaps the most scary looking apostle in base form we've ever seen. And we're including Zod in this conversation. There is just something so unnerving about his towering stature and the demonic energy radiating from him that you can't help but feel like nothing you can do will work against this guy. And that's before he becomes a friggin' corundum scale dragon. Grunbeld is an awesome side character whose ascendance, well, highly contested, does give us a good glimpse into why Griffith's control old apostles are able to resist their baser desires. But we know you guys were just here for the cool panels of Grunbeld's dragon mode, so we're going to leave you to that and see you in the comment section down below. If you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. This has been Corey Whelan for Marvelous Videos. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.